Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. Many of our episodes discuss and reference indirectly the Fort King Road. Seminole Wars Foundation even had a virtual march related to walking on the Fort King Road. In this episode, we're going to discuss how the Fort King Road was constructed. Why was it constructed? What was it made of? How was it maintained? Who used it? And how it fared during wartime? Especially if you had baggage trains that you were trying to protect, circuiting from Fort Brooke in the south near Tampa Bay up to Fort King near present-day Ocala and about really nothing else. Archaeologist Sean Norm joins us to discuss the Fort King Road's part in the Second Seminole War, how it was constructed, and why it was even needed. Sean Norman, welcome back to the Seminole Wars. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for having me. What can you tell our listeners about how important the Fort King Road was to prosecution of the war? Not only a key, it is probably the key military feature of the first two years of the war. The Fort King Road definitely a major role in how the war was conducted, both for the U.S. military and for the Seminole. It provides the avenue from which the initial commanders of the Second War conduct all of the initial campaign through the first two years of the war. At least while the war was raging in the central Florida Peninsula, it would be hard to avoid the Fort King Road in conducting operations. For the U.S. military, it gave them at least prior to the loss of Dade's column, it was considered relatively safe. It would have been considered far more safe than just traveling through the woods or using the Indian trails or anything like that. It was tremendously faster to move up. When you look at it would take units weeks to travel from the north side of the Withlacoochee to Tampa Bay, coming from the Camp Izzard route, especially before the Blaze Trail was established there. Whereas I would say three days, three days was, was fairly reasonable to travel between Fort Brooke and, and Fort Kent, but it's a lot slow. The key thing was, is the travel of wagons and cannons. Now, they don't use a lot of cannons on these campaigns, usually one or two. The Seminole knew this road because they used this road, and that gave them certain advantages as the war progressed. The Seminole were able to you know, utilize the road when they wanted to, especially before the outposts were constructed. Seminole would have been able to travel by it at will. The Seminole would be able to keep tabs on the U.S. military. They do a really good job throughout the first few years of the war, anticipating the military's move. They know when Clinch is crossing the Withlacoochee. They know when Scott's crossing the Withlacoochee. They know when Call was approaching Fort Drain. The 14 Road would have been a more obvious example in that section. You know exactly where the soldiers are not going to fray from. It's an easier way of picking people off. Any stragglers you had, isolated people, people out on hunting missions, timbering missions, fishing missions, something like that would have made easy targets along the 14 Road. We've got Dade's battle, in which case the Seminole used the road very effectively because they have clear fields of fire, defensive structures, by trapping the U.S. military in the middle of the road. They make pretty short work of them. How would the Seminole be using the Fort King Road? Keep tabs and possibly control the U.S. military. Blow them or stop them by burning a bridge or maybe damaging the road in a spot here or there. You could just use it as an intelligence network. Seminole could also use it for speedy travel as well if they wanted to. How did the Seminole use the Fort King Road? Before the war, probably would have used it as a road. It would have been just as valuable to them. They might have used wagons far less, but it still would have been an easier way of moving large quantities of people. During the war, it keeps a way of keeping tabs on the U.S. military. If you know the U.S. military is traveling along certain predetermined trails, they're much easier to follow. Seminole could keep track of them in the middle of nowhere, but when they're on the road, it was even easier than that. They obviously used it at key times to, such as Dade's battle, to obliterate an entire unit or to slow or stall other issues. Along the Fort King Road, in vicinity at least, the Seminoles were an opportunistic warrior tribe. Please share some examples. You see it multiple times. The Seminole make more attempts to engage when soldiers are relaxed. First battle of the Withlacoochee, when Clinch crosses over the river, it's when the soldiers start resting a little bit and they're relaxing when they get attacked. It's quite possible that the Seminole are basically waiting for that. They might have planned the ambush to take place in other parts or considered other aspects 
suspects there might have been a backup location if it hadn't taken place there. A lot of it is just following the behavior of the U.S. troops. And the Seminole were just really good at observing and, and dealing with that. How else did the Seminole let their presence and their strength known to the soldiers? Mantling aspects of the road, specifically the bridges, would have been one other way of essentially hindering the U.S. military without having to directly engage. Many factors can affect where one may conduct an ambush, and the natural terrain used may be very different. There are some areas that are better than others for ambushing troops. Battle of Sinota Sassa, the Seminole were able to use a creek bed. They had almost a natural fortification for a bit. What did the transformation of the Fort King Road mean for the Seminole? For the Seminole, it would have represented, one, it does provide that danger of these roads going really close to Seminole villages. So it means that Seminole villages have to seclude themselves even more. So you get some that go further into the swamp, whereas other villages might have even gone into more unlikely areas than that. We see it with villages burning like Chukachetti, where it appears that they actually retreated up to a hilly area which is very different from where the Seminole normally occupy. You probably would have had similar things along the Fort King Road. In order to obscure a village from sight from anyone moving along the route, you would have had to go to greater length. What were the benefits to keeping the Fort King Road open during the war? It would have been an avenue to speed up things, but it would have been more information to see what was going on. The Battle of Wahoo Swamp is an example. It was not too far from the Fort King Road. Battle of Wahoo Swamp takes place where it does. The Wahoo Swamp's a key place to concentrate people. And you've got Jumper, one of the major military leaders during the war, nearby. It might have just been proximity to large towns. They are traveling from a little bit west of the forks of the Withlacoochee around where Panasofsky drains into the river through the Wahoo Swamp, through about Bushnell. And that was a key concentration where they were already at. Talk in more detail about Seminole movement. Seminole were able to move very quickly. They could have adjusted plan as necessary, especially for the first year of the war. Anything off the road is firmly in Seminole territory, and you were definitely in danger. Today, we like to flatter ourselves that the wars we fight have no front lines. As if this never happened before, they should look at the Florida War. Tell us about those boundaries and those front lines. There were no boundaries to the war. Homesteaders, what limited population there was, was gathered throughout the territory. American settlers had been moving in well into the first Spanish period. So you had a scattered landscape. From at least a civilian perspective, it was impossible to protect everyone. That's the white settler standpoint. What's the Seminole side? From the Seminole side, it was because their movement was so fluid. Seminole had a long history of traveling long distances. They were creeks. South Florida was common hunting ground all the way into the Everglades. It's nothing for them to move long distances in relatively short spans of time, such as at the end of the war, there are still sizable amounts of Seminole in the Okefenokee Swamp in South Georgia. So it's that idea that every time soldiers clear a place out, they can't permanently hold out the Seminole. As far as the U.S. military goes, like, there's no consistent front. There's no consistent battle lines or unified structures, siege works, earthworks defensive structures, nothing like that. Instead, you have all these isolated outposts, these forts, and they're just kind of in the middle of nowhere. Anything is open game. There's just not enough soldiers to cover all the ground to fully defend one front. You have Seminole are definitely coordinating, but there are people with their own autonomy. And so you can have units of Seminole attacking on one side of the state that has almost nothing to do with Seminole attacking on the other side. It made for a very, very chaotic region. The Seminole got very good at evading U.S. soldiers because they didn't really have any alternative. When you think about it, the Seminole never had any sort of safe haven. Even before the Second War, even before the First War, you go into like the Patriot War, people from another country are coming into a foreign territory and basically interfering with the local population. Andrew Jackson marches into Florida repeatedly with impunity. It's, yeah, I mean, they could be attacked at any given time. By the time you get to the Second War, Seminole clearly were doing some organization. After the Treaty of Payne's Landing in 1832, you definitely see a movement towards some of the more secluded areas, specifically the areas around Wittkova, the Wittlacoochee, and the Wahoo Swamp. It has defensive structure. Obviously, his war goes on. The war takes place all over the territory, and military just keeps evolving tactics to adjust to it to where eventually you end up with the rowboats going through the Everglades. Yeah, wholesale war. The lack of a front on one side meant that there was a lack of a front on the other side. The war had no safe spots for anybody. It was a complete warscape across the territory. How did this, for instance, affect General Clinch's operations at the beginning of the war? 
Clinch goes to cross the Withlacoochee three days after Dade's battle and Wiley Thompson's assassination, right? The Seminole are following Clinch's troops because they know exactly when he's crossing the river. This should not be surprising, as the Seminole had many villages right in that vicinity. They would have been coalesced probably closer to the forks in the Withlacoochee River, probably around Lake Panasofsky. They could have been all the way down to Jumper's Village in the Wahoo Swamp. Clearly, there were Seminole occupying that entire area, and there was at least some sort of intelligence network going on, if not large-scale occupation of the region. How did the war transform the Fort King Road? As the war goes on, it not only becomes main avenue of transport, but it also becomes a boundary. The first really major theater of war, while action can take place anywhere in the territory, the first real theater of war is the COVID. When Jessup takes command at the end of 1836, he establishes Forts Foster, Dade, and Armstrong. Those hem in the eastern side of the Cove at the Withlacoochee. Not the large villages like Jumpersville, where the Battle of Wahoo Swamp takes place. That's really close to Fort Armstrong. Alachuteca, the first village that you would encounter on the road to Chukachetti when departing from the Fort King Road, would have been relatively close to Fort Foster. Fort Alabama, the predecessor to Fort Foster, was constructed at the same spot. And it was used as the staging point for Colonel Lindsay's campaign to go burn down Chukajetti and ideally unite with General Eustace and General Scott's wings in that campaign. It was the point attached protecting their rear. And then it also was useful as a place to put sick and wounded people. The road becomes this whole system as the war goes on. It's that fort system that sheds light into the area that leads into Taylor's Fort Square. You see it as a learning experience for the U.S. military. As the war goes on, things get more complicated. There's no consistent front. There's no consistent battle lines or unified structures, siege works, earthworks, defensive structures, nothing like that. Instead, you have all these isolated outposts, these forts, and they're just kind of in the middle of nowhere. Anything is open game. There's just not enough soldiers to cover all the ground to fully defend one front. The Army's mission was to remove the Seminole, but the Seminole comprised various tribes and bands, and this was confusing to the Army. You have Seminole are definitely coordinating, but there are people with their own autonomy. And so you can have units of Seminole attacking on one side of the state, that it has almost nothing to do with Seminole attacking on the other side. It made for a very, very chaotic region. The war moves on from the cove of the Withlacoochee, and it moves south. And that meant its role in facilitating swift movement of troops was greatly lessened. The war goes on, and the U.S. military tightens its grip. They start constructing more and more forts. They start mapping more of the area. They start blazing more trails in between forts, even between Seminole villages after they start discovering them. Then... And basically kind of closed down that theater. We know that Seminoles still return to the Cove of the Withlacoochee because Armistead sends a thousand men or more up to Fort King towards the end of the war in an attempt to interfere with the Green Corn Dance that was still occurring around the Cove of the Withlacoochee, even late in the war after the war had moved well far south. It had dire implications for both sides. The Army was criticized for poor soldiering, for poor marksmanship, and the training that went with that. However, it may be something even more basic that contributed to the Army's frustration in the early days of the war. First several campaigns of the war came down to supply. The limiting factor was always supply. Gain from his movement was stopping everywhere he could to get supplies. It was hunting down the Seminole in between traveling to their different forts to get more rations. The thing these people said was by far the most difficult challenge of the war. The two biggest challenges that the U.S. military faced was, A, basically the fluidity with which the Seminole moved across the landscape and their knowledge of the landscape. And then the second thing would have been supplies for the U.S. military. All campaigns are limited by how much food they have. Usually the American forces had numerical superiority, and if they could have just roamed around the countryside, they would have theoretically ran into the Seminole more often than they did, but they commonly had to pull out early. Keeping them supplied was very, very important. In the end, I think we still see that resupplying through Tampa Bay was probably more efficient, definitely easier just to move groups from New Orleans. As one thing that we learned with Paul's campaign, there were a limited number of ships that were available, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. If those ships were otherwise occupied, and again, there are multiple conflicts going on. You've got Texan War of Independence. You have Creek removal. You have Cherokee removal. U.S. military supplies and troops being moved all throughout the South during this time. By far, the military road would have been the easiest and fastest way, just due to the size and clearance of it. You needed that backup route. The main, these units would have needed baggage train. 
Discuss the Army's many uses for the Fort King Road. The Army would have used the Fort King Road for moving troops. They would have used it for bases, for reconnoitering and mapping the area, and then moving supplies, as well as mail. Assuming that they're well supplied, so they're not hungry, the main thing probably just would have been the fear, especially after Dade's battle. Dade's battle really gets that idea that you can be attacked at any time. And we see other examples. Colonel Foster gets attacked on his way back from relieving Fort Alabama. He gets attacked around Lake San Otisassa. That would have been the main concern, is just knowing that you're stuck on this one path and everything around you, for large portions of it, would have been densely vegetated, particularly a saw palmetto that would have grown along the side of large portions of it that run through the pine barrens, would have made just conceals an enemy. That would have been the main concern, if they're well supplied. Oh, and if they're not well supplied? If they're not well supplied, then you have issues of having to forage and hunt and all that, which again makes people easy targets. And, and that's where a significant portion of the soldiers who were actually killed by Seminole during the war, a lot of them were actually just killed in isolated incidents like this. Troops marched on the Fort King Road, of course, but if one wanted to bring in mounted troops, that was a whole nother map. What did that entail and why did it create such grief? Volunteer and militia units tended to be mounted. What happens is you have to bring that in. But then again, that means that you need more livestock to bring those supplies in, which then means you need more supplies to feed the livestock that you're then bringing in. It's a perpetual challenge. A lot of the vegetation out here just isn't suitable. And again, soldiers wouldn't have been particularly great at foraging. Food that might have been available, U.S. soldiers tended to burn. Any available crop and such, they would have relied on it. But the problem is, is it slows them down. It makes them susceptible. And we see that in several of the campaigns where if wagons are in the back of the column, sometimes you might actually send armies piecemeal. We had issues with that looking at Call's campaign where I would read one report and Call would talk about leaving at night. And I'd read somebody else's diary and they would say that they left in the morning and they might send out units piecemeal. If you had baggage trains that were isolated or poorly defended, they were very easy target. That was a problem early on in the war. In fact, the, the engagement at Micanopy before the war officially started was one of those where baggage trains were getting attacked. They were just very, very vulnerable because you're in plain sight and you're really restricted to an isolated route. You would prefer to overnight at a fort if there was one. If the Seminole want to burn the bridge over, say, the Hillsborough River and there's no fort there, then that is making the baggage train a sitting duck. The wagons and cannons slow you down. It slowed Major Dade's column down. While you say it could take three days for infantrymen to make that route without cannons and wagons, it took longer and led to disaster for Major Dade. Over time, the Army addressed that heavy cannon issue. The Army introduced a lighter cannon, easier to maneuver, but with less punch. The reason why they're using mountain howitzers here. They're smaller, lighter guns. They're not particularly great artillery in most forms of combat, but they're easier to move. And that's partially just because of the terrible, terrible terrain down here, just because of the wet conditions, sandy soils, and then all the rivers and wetlands they're having to cross. It provides a much easier avenue for moving troops up and down. You can't state how useful that would have been. Military trails that extend farther in South Florida, dealing with bringing forts down there, they would have at least in some degree replicated the Fort King Road. We joined our story of the Fort King Road and media res, that is, in the middle. We looked at the battles, we looked at how it was used to get to battles from a historical standpoint. Now we're going to leap back to take a look at how we got to having a Fort King Road. It goes back to a treaty. The federal government forced the Treaty of Moultrie Creek on the Seminole and created a reservation for the Seminole in the center of the Florida Peninsula. To carry out the federal government side of the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, the Army had to build a fort to support the Indian Agency, which was created by that treaty. And then it found it would be good to have a road that would connect that fort, that Indian Agency, to Fort Brooke, which was in Tampa Bay, and had access to the Gulf. The Treaty of Moultrie Creek in 1823 established the Florida Reservation in the interior of Florida. You have an influx of activity that happens specifically around the northern section of the reservation. The Indian agent, Gad Humphreys, erects the Indian agency on property. Following that, they want to erect a new outpost along this. Now, the Indian agency and the road are constructed first, and then they build the fort by 1827. So I think they start building the road around 1825, a couple years after the treaty. When did planning to build a Fort King Road begin? Fort King Road was originally planned in early 1825. 
They started planning it around the start of the year, still working on it all the way through 1826. Part of that is they do have several issues with bridges. Bridges did wash out, so they were having to do repairs along portions of the road somewhat while they were still constructing it. In 1825, they really start planning out and developing the road itself, and that's to connect the Indian Agency at the north end of the reservation with Fort Brook on Tampa Bay. They end up taking the better part of two years just between planning and construction. They have problems with the construction of it in 1826. There ends up being a, a series of bad floods that destroys a lot of the bridges. So literally, while they're building the road, they're still having to repair and maintain portions of it. For, for labor, what they did is Gad Humphreys, the Indian agent at the time, oversaw the construction as well as a couple of military officers. They used discharged U.S. soldiers, and then they used black seminal in the construction of it. They used black seminals. That's curious. What's interesting about the use of black seminal is... I don't know whether that was voluntary or not. Traditionally, especially that's a a significant portion of the war is about, especially the first two wars, re-enslaving African Americans. When I hear discharged soldiers in Black Seminole, it sounds like these are probably people probably brought back into slavery, but I would really need further information on that. What was his purpose before the war and how was it used during? They wanted overland route because Fort Brook was isolated. The only way of moving supplies and men in and out of there was via water. Usually you would have steamships come in from New Orleans or Pensacola. And this was problematic because? Because the logistical centers in Florida were mostly around Picolata, Gary's Ferry, Jacksonville, and then you had St. Mary's, Georgia, just across the border. The 14 Road was an attempt to connect those areas with Tampa Bay. What it did is it connected on with the limited quantity of other roads, specifically Wanton's Road, which extended from Black Creek or Gary's Ferry down to the town of Mikino. Mikino would have been a fortified town. And where was this town in relation to the reservation or Fort King? Mikino was north of the reservation. It was a legal town from Micanopy. The Fort King Road, a military road, banded on Wanton's Road down to Fort Brook. Rather than a road, why wasn't a northern river route used? Another option, the landing at Silver Springs. So east by several miles of Fort King, you've got Silver Springs, which can be used as a navigable route all the way to the St. John's River and all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. It really wasn't utilized as much. It's a complicated path, but theoretically, if the Seminole Reservation had lasted longer, if they hadn't been forcibly removed, it could conceivably have been another way of connecting up with supplies. In which case, if you could bypass all of Wanton's route, the Fort King Road would become immensely important. Later on, you see tourism and you do see movement of U.S. population using that waterway. It provided contact, provided a mail service. So as we talked about with the Wahoo Swamp, it would take weeks for orders to arrive. And sometimes those orders wouldn't arrive at all. That road made mail travel possible to Fort Brook. It kept him as part of the country, essentially. What was Lawton's route? Lawton was Edward Lawton, who is a settler in Micanopy. He was an important person in essentially the largest town this far south. It would have been the largest town closest to the reservation, I believe. Wanton's route was an overland route that went through central peninsula of Florida, connecting the town of Micanopy, heading northeast towards Black Creek. And at Black Creek, there was a small town set up around a ferry system called Gary's Ferry. The town formed up later on as the war went up that became a more and more important supply depot called Fort Hyleman. And Wanton's route connected Micanopy to Black Creek. From Black Creek, which is modern-day Middleburg, Florida, you could then either travel up Black Creek, Doctor's Lake, which would take you right there at the mouth of the St. John's River. So you had access to the Atlantic Ocean, access to Jacksonville, and then you could connect up to St. Mary's George. Considering the swampy Florida terrain, there weren't a lot of routes for people to take through the center of the peninsula, whether it was north, south, or east and west. In Florida, especially in the wet areas of the center part of the state, following ridge, like if you're traveling east to west through Eustis, Tavares area, it's pretty obvious what routes you're going to have to take between all those lakes. Even though there aren't quite as many lakes on the Fort King Road area, it's still a ton of sinks, a lot of wetlands, and so you do have straightforward high ground. 
U.S. military, U.S. settlers regularly rely on. Basically, they go with paths of easiest resistance. U.S. military would have relied on building on Native American roads or Native American paths already. If there were sections that were incomplete or needed expansion, then you could have blaze trails on it. The road would have used the existing networks of paths and then would have expanded upon that first from a blaze trail to a more expanded road. What I mean when I say a blaze trail is that there's been some form of modification to it. It's usually been marked, identified, and cleared to at least some degree. Now, you can kind of almost think of like different classes of roads, sort of like you might have in national forests or military base, where you have your main avenues, which tend to be kept well-maintained in good shape so that higher volumes of traffic can move through there. And then the more fringe roads you get tend to be in worse shape, they're narrower and less often maintained, less often traveled. During the war, Fort King would have been the epitome of that. It would have been the best road available in the main theater of war in the, around the cove of the Winter Coochie in the beginning. And so it had construction to it. It's got this corduroy wood pattern. You do have constructed, fairly well-built bridges over decent ravines across river crossings. It's more than just a blaze trail. They maintained a certain width. They would devegetate it so that they could operate as they wanted to, so that they could march in necessary columns, so that they could wagons and artillery in the interior of the marching column, protect them. It did have certain specifications that needed to be maintained. Other roads, such as the road from Fort Drain down to Camp Izzard, would have been a Native American trail that just got expanded through repeated use. When Call or Clinch were moving through that area or Scott, they might widen it enough to fit what columns, what size units they were moving through the area. On the other hand, they might also have to adjust their formations to the road itself. If there are any improvements, such as the corduroy logging, it's less common. They weren't as regularly maintained. It comes uh, repeated use. That's how you end up with east-west roads along the north end of the Whitlacoochee, going all the way out to Camp Clinch. But Fort King would have been the one maintained road throughout the war, whereas the rest received significantly less attention. The trite expression is, don't reinvent the wheel. When it came to the Fort King Road, they didn't have to reinvent the road. They could adapt the road that had been built before them. What was the most important consideration? Anything that's clear. It's a relatively maintained military road like Fort King. Huge improvements on a blazed road. Blazed road would have been an improvement on probably an Indian trail. Indian trail would have been a huge improvement on nothing. By treaty, we had the Fort King Road running straight through the Seminole Reservation. The road did go through the reservation with permission, but it really wasn't supposed to be a publicly traveled road. Aside from traders, honestly, nobody had any business going back there anyway. It was supposed to be completely sovereign land. U.S. settlers shouldn't have been that far south. Just military access through sovereign territory. Nevertheless, the Fort King Road was the major thoroughfare through the Seminole Reservation. But it's not really that well known to the American public. Where does it stand in relation to other famous roads? Thinking of famous roads, you've got the Roman roads that persist to this day. Just eloquent, basically pieces of architecture in and of themselves. Multiple layers, tapping it off with cobble, right? Those roads are still usable in Italy, Spain. Nice engineering. They did not have that luck with the Fort King Road. Other than the Bellamy Road and Wantons Road, so the Bellamy Road would have been a continuation of the Spanish east-west roads in very north Florida. And then you had Wanton creating the road to Micanopy. There wasn't really a lot here. Any form of road in the form of blazed trails would have been an improvement to what they had. Because other than that, you're having to use game trails or other prehistoric or seminal Indian trails. So when you compare it to the quality or traffic of a Roman road, Fort King Road's not quite comparable just simply because, A, it didn't have that much traffic. And then the other issue would have been time and building material. If they had really built a fancy cobblestone road before the war, that might have been possible, where you weren't being harassed or obstructed in any way. But, of course, you run into one major problem. You don't have the rock to build it here. All we have is limestone, which becomes the same issue with West Pointers trying to build fortifications and bridges. Everything that you're taught in the northeastern United States is to build stone fortifications, stone roads, stone bridges, unless you're just doing temporary things like pontoons. There was a lack of material. Another thing is the amount of wood that would be necessary if you really wanted to corduroy the entire road. You already have problems with the fort, particularly Fort Dade crossing over the Whippacoochee. 
because, like I said, they had to constantly rebuild the bridge. Before the outposts were built, the Seminole would regularly come through and just burn the bridges themselves because they didn't use them anyway. But even without them, you would have flooding that would take out the bridges. So the thing is this constant rebuilding of the bridges and then having to build and maintain forts next to it. And then all the wood burning that goes through just having people on site, you would have be forced a little talk. You might have been stretching the wood if you tried to corduroy the entire extent. And then on top of that, that would have been extremely time consuming, depending on who you're using for labor. Very expensive way of using militia. You really do have to calculate what resources you're going to use where, and building defensive fortifications or bridges were far more important. They managed to get by in other areas without the roads, but it was a regular logistical challenge and scheduling often conflicted. The other difference between a Roman road is while they were, especially, you know, the ones in Gaul or, or Germany or other areas, what might have initially been military roads, it was still that purpose that it was going to be a publicly traveled road. There might have been thoughts that following the removal of the Seminole, that 14 Road would be a major road. Today's US 301, without the interstate, it would be a major avenue. But at the time, it just didn't have the traffic. And considering it was constructed seven years before the treaty for the removal was even started, it just wasn't expected to be a well-traveled public road. What kind of road was it? 14 Road consisted of the road itself, which was a corduroy style road in a lot of the soggy areas. For large portions of it, it was made made of interlaced law. They would be placed in one direction and then in a second layer would be placed perpendicular. You'd make this corduroy pattern into the ground. That was in the soggier sections, particularly to provide footing for artillery and wagons that move through there. And then you have the various bridges, the road crosses the Withlacoochee, both forks, and it crosses the Hillsborough River. So there were bridges placed at, at these different crossings. How sturdy or built to last were these? They were burned over time or uh, washed out multiple times. Bridges usually didn't last longer than a year. Eventually, you have the construction of more outposts. How long would it take to trek? Typically, it would take... Uh, you could do it in two days, two to three days before outposts were constructed. There weren't necessarily fresh horses to be had along the way. If a rider could acquire fresh horses, they could conceivably do it in a day. The Fort King Road through the Seminole Reservation, was it a no-stop zone, or was there any place where the troops could water their horses? And... Prior to the outposts, you'd had what were called way stations, which would have been known places that would have had springs or access to fresh water, and places that would have been good places to camp. A lot of these outposts are these way stations become the outposts of the forts along the way, and then the forts are also there to guard the, the river crossings. So that's Fort Foster, Fort Dade are specifically covering river crossings, and then you've got Fort Armstrong is one of those that would be one of the way stations where it'd be a watering place and just a place to rest and camp. How do these way stations operate before the conflict began? Prior to the war, the way stations probably would have been there, but even the road wouldn't travel that much by large part. It would have been a lot of mail and then just small convoys. And a lot of the forts weren't constructed. Who would the way stations serve? The soldiers and anybody else? Way stations would have been there for anyone to stop, but particularly they would have been consistent places where small units might have stopped. Good access to fresh water for moderate sized amounts of men as well as their horses. The way stations would have been very minimal at the time. There were large portions of time where between Fort Brook and Micanopy, it was a completely undefended. How many trading posts were there and who got to use them? You have numerous trading posts, and those are for the Seminole. A handful of traders going all the way back into the colonial period, Stanton and Leslie, have been given permission to trade or access the Seminole. They would build trading posts throughout the, before the reservation, all the way going back into Spanish times. They would have moved trading posts to key towns. One of the things that Brent Wiseman postulated was that you have towns start fissioning so they have more access to trading posts. So you actually get an increase of towns during the late 1700s and early 1800s with the addition of more trading posts in the region. Trading posts would have been usually for the Seminole. We have some evidence that there might have been a trading post around Fort King, any place where you do have large civilian populations, but there shouldn't really be civilian populations inside the reservation at all. We'll have to leave it there. In our next episode, we'll discuss Gary's report on what it discovered from its survey at Ronaldo, Sean Norman. Thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars. It's always a pleasure. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. 
Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.summonawars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation 2021. All rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast em, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.